what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is, is SPTV. SPTV. Welcome back, everybody, for more SPTV. Uh, I'm joined today by special guest Mitch Brisker, who is one of the reasons why every day on SPTV is a bad day to be David Miscavige. But it's a great day not to be in a cult. Uh, welcome to the channel, Mitch. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great, Aaron. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. You know, one thing I'd like to do is um, put our names up on the screen. Green. Okay. There we go. Aaron and Mitch. That'll be good enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. All right. Now, so the, the I titled this video Scientology film director Mitch Brisker. And uh let's let's just tell everyone who you are. How do you describe who you are? Oh, now or back then? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Who am I? I'm, uh, I'm, I usually describe myself as being a, a mile wide and an inch deep, but you know, I don't know that that branding really works in this situation. I was, I, I got into Scientology uh, in 1973. I was a film school dropout. I was addicted to drugs. I, I, that's a whole story. We can do all that. You know, I got into. No, 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 no. That, that, that's not, that's, I mean, oh, we can do all that because we have all the time yeah. in the world, but yeah. like you are not. Um, so. I mean, it's a loaded question, but how, yeah. like, but in present time, in present time, if you would be like, this is who I am, this is, um, this is oh, right, my, right. my Scientology experience. This, this is who, who have you been to David Miscavige for the last 40 years? Oh, well, according to the last letter I got from him in 2018, we're friends. I, I doubt that we're friends anymore, but, um, although I do have, in some respects, I have a lot of admiration for him and for a long time, I, you know, cause I, he never abused me directly. I mean, at the times I experienced abuse and none of it was ever physical. It was always via proxies. You know, he has like a, you know, uh, flying monkeys that like hover around him that he can, whatever, the tack dogs, flying monkeys are all the same thing. So, but I was never directly abused by him. Uh, so what was I to, I mean, I was, uh, when I came to gold in 1990, early 1990, keep in mind Golden Air Productions was established by L. Ron Hubbard for one purpose, to make the technical training films. Now, jump back to 1965, and he's running Scientology internationally in St. Hill in England, and he strolls out onto the back patio of his manor uh, and very casually throws a leg up on a little wall, and he delivers a filmed lecture in black and white. And in that lecture, he says that Scientology is only going to go so far as it's taught correctly. And it can only be taught correctly if you can see how it's done. And you can only see how it's done in a film at the scale, because he couldn't go around the world and train everybody, right? And he certainly couldn't train enough people to train other people. They really needed to see films, right? So he established on that day that the single most important thing that was going to determine the success of Scientology, because back then the, the success of it was based on whether auditing worked and people had good results and had good outcomes, outcomes from it, right? I mean, that that would have been the metric by which you judge his success. Um, so then, you know, flash forward, I think it's around 1978, and he goes out to La Quinta, where they have their winter headquarters, and uh, starts setting up, uh, starts writing those films. So, so from 1965 to 1970, he did a bunch of other promotional type stuff in media, but not the technical training film. So the, this was this, I mean, I think I've underscored the importance of it. The, those films were like life and death for Scientology. You have got to train auditors. And the only way you can train auditors, they have got to see how it's done. So he starts writing these films finally in 1978. He, he was at W, they call it W because it was winter headquarters. And then there were the FBI raids, right? I think that was 78. And uh, whatever, whenever the FBI raids were, he fled to Sparks, Nevada, just to get out of town until things cooled off. And while he was there, he communicated with the people. Uh, you know, I, Mike was there. I mean, he probably knows all about this. Um, he communicated with them, like, start reading these books. Start studying film. We're going to make some films. These are people that nobody knew anything about film, right? So then he goes back to La Quinta, and starts writing these films and making these films. And they never get completed. Uh, there was a total of 26 of them. They never get completed. 
and the ones that do complete it, or you've seen them, can you just describe for me in one word the quality of those films? The ones <laughs> that LRH himself yeah, did? you saw that when you yeah. were... I'll use two words, pure trash. Pure trash, embarrassingly bad, right? Yeah. So bad that you had to hold your nose and just watch them because they had information in them that you needed to finish your course, right? You needed yeah. study, so you just... But, you know, I was... in film school and then I was uh, making TV commercials and I was a professional in film. So for me, it was like, yeah, uh, like I had communicated to people at gold when I met them, Hey, let me know if you ever want me to come up there. I'd be happy to, I don't even mean as an egotistical thing, but I was a Scientologist and I wanted to help out. So you know, I had literally told people, I like, given them my phone number when like, Hey, I'll come up there. And they never heard from them. But so, um, uh, so it had been about 15 years since Hubbard had finished a film. The other people had tried and failed. Um, and, and it's amazing because they had incredible resources for both training people and for actually making them. But they just continued to fail at it. I mean, before I got there, the best thing that they had done was that, well, I call it the, the bad sweater video, you know, the one that was ridiculed on Sweater in the Wall. Um, oh, the We Stand Tall music yeah, video. I, I call it the bad sweater video. It's, <laughs> like, uh, it's just a little more, I think, descriptive. It's, I was like the best thing they'd done. So and I, I had nothing to do with that. That happened before I got there. Uh, so they were really desperate. The, the shoot crew, which is the crew responsible for shooting the film, they had all been banished to the galley, to the dining room. And they were washing dishes and, you know, scraping grease out of the fryer and all that kind of stuff. And they weren't allowed to go near their equipment. And uh, Miscavige had ordered that they find a pro. Uh, Hubbard had written some policy, some uh, an, an advice about, yeah, hire some. You can do that. You can hire professionals. So it wasn't just a crazy idea, right? You know, they'd heard it. So uh, just to back up a little earlier, I, I forgot the part. I left out the part about working with Jeff Hawkins on the Dianetics campaign. They first approached me in the 80s. Jeff was doing that campaign, the questions asked. Oh, he hadn't done that yet. I did that with him. And Jeff had this amazing uh, a grip on how to market a book. And so I was contacted as a commercial director. I went in and worked with him. Marketing at that time was in LA at the, you know, that blue building, right? Say no more. Um, so we worked out of there. And me and another guy who was a, had been a creative director at Shia Day, and so we did these ads under Jeff's supervision. Uh, we were the creative component and he did like the tactical and did writing and stuff like that. And in a, you know, you had a book that was published in 1950 and then by 1960, I'm sorry, by 1984-ish, it had sold 3 million copies. And, and it was a 30 year old book. And, and that book in the next three years between uh, that uh, sold 10 million copies. So Jeff's strategy just like went through the roof, of course. He was handsomely rewarded by a pump being having the shit beat out of him by David Miscavige. Um, then they've never sold Dianetics books like that again. That's how they first found out about me. That's how I got on their radar because I, I did that Dianetics campaign with Jab, right? And um, so anyway, so I, I, I think the way it went down was, you know, they were having all these tr this trouble at gold. The, the, they couldn't get films done. Everybody who tried was like declared or chopping trees down or something, and uh, they they saw this success going on with the Dynamics campaign in L.A. So it was like, who are, who is this guy? You know, I I, I think Miscavige. I, I don't think he could handle it. It was just like it was going on so far out of his purview. It was like let's get them up here. So I was invited up. I was sort of romance to do this one film which had been in this, the sets had been in the studio, literally collecting dust for nine months. You know, usually a set, you build it, you shoot it before the paint's dry and then it's gone, right? But this one had literally been in there for nine months. So we did this whole little romancing thing and blah, blah, blah. And uh, that's how I got up there. So I went up there and I did a film. And what Miscavige did, what he dismantled the whole marketing unit in LA and had it move up to the int base because he wanted all that within his purview. And so that's how I got up there. And I did a film and I did not know it, but Hubbard had mandated that it should take two and a half weeks to shoot a film. 
but that had never been done. Not even Hubbard had done it. And um, nobody had successfully held the post until I showed up. So, but see, Aaron, I don't know any of this, right? Held, held what post? Of, of director, I'm sorry. Like there had only been one person who got films done that ended up in orcs, and that was L. Ron Hubbard, right? But I didn't know any of this. And I didn't know that the shoe crew were all being held, you know, were all ordered into the galley. And I didn't know that no films, I didn't know any of this. So when I, I walked into it and then after a couple of weeks of, in, of briefings and indoctrinations and taking some courses, which was completely, I, I didn't understand why I had to take them because I've been working for 20 years. But I, I learned later that by doing the basic film courses at Gold, it enabled them to later take ownership for my ability to make films. Like they could sort of create this illusion for themselves that they had just kind of taught me my, what. but in reality, uh, I could have driven up there, jumped out of my car, done the you know shot for a day and jumped back I'm like I'm driven away and that would have been that uh, you know come back the next day but so um we finished this film in two and a half weeks and all of a sudden it was like something miraculous had happened and all of a sudden I was in this position where I felt like the you know the explorer who crash landed on a primitive island and the, the indigenous people thought you were a god I mean that's what it and I'm it's like I was working in L.A. and like in my metier, you know, and I was, you know, sometimes I was a nine or a 10, but most days I was a seven. But at Gold, I was an 11. So that was, you know what I'm saying? That was in, in its own way kind of intoxicating. But it was also a little over the top, the reaction, right? But it kind of bonded me to the crew because it was like, God, I really want to help these guys. So. I, and I still get messages from early crew members that I met who left and had successful careers saying, you know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have had the courage to leave. I wouldn't have had the confidence to know I could have a career on my own. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm kind of forced into retirement and don't have a, a, a very certain outcome, which I'm trying to change. But I do have that. You know, I did made a very I've made a very positive impact on that place. Uh, did I answer your question? I sort of. Yeah, probably. Um, so when you got up there and what was the film that you filmed in 10 weeks? Oh, no, two and a half. Oh, weeks. sorry. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. It's no weeks. problem. It's what, no problem. What was it? Uh, it was Start, Change, Stop. Hmm. The I did that film twice. The first one I did, it was prepackaged in, in that the sets were in the studio and it was all cast. I reviewed it all and said, OK, fine, I'll do it like that. And uh it was not up to my standards, but it was like they needed some parental supervision to get them through a film or they were just going to, that crew was in, they were really looking at a very uncertain outcome for themselves. So it was a big deal. And I responded to that. I'm like, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'll get you guys. We'll get to the other side of the, you know, I'll sail the ship over all the rocks and we'll get it to the other side. Mm -hmm. And then when it happened, like, this dam burst open. All of a sudden, there were like all these films that had to be made. And there was, you know, films for events. And re it really triggered uh, like everything that ha started happening at Gold. Yeah. You know, it was like uh, they were trying to make a loaf of bread and they had no yeast. And then the yeast showed up. <laughs> so the <laughs> loaf rose. So uh, it was kind of really the simplicity of it. So when Scientology puts their hate website about you, it's going to quote you as saying, uh, even Mitch Brisker says he's nothing but a bunch of yeast. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, I wrote a book called uh, Scientology, The Big Lie. And and before I ever started speaking out, I thought I'm going to go buy Mitch Brisker, The Big Liar, because absolutely they're going <laughs> to buy that one. <laughs> and then I thought, no, fuck them. They can have it. Absolutely. Because they make, you know, such fools out of themselves by doing this stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of people at Gold that I truly care about, people that helped me during times when I was not doing well and blah, blah, blah. And I was reluctant to speak out because of them, because, you know, they need to be allowed to have their own space, but which they don't have. That. And I realized after a while that, you know, keeping silent doesn't ever help the victim. It just helps the abuser. And, uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, and I think... The world is experiencing a reckoning when it comes to the kinds of activities that that result in harm, right? Like you saw this blow up with Me Too, and you 
you're seeing it blow up on YouTube with lots of channels, not just about Scientology, but, you know, uh, Mormons and, and all kinds of wherever there's abuse, people are shining a light on it. And it, it's, you know, the Internet is maturing into this community of people that are, you know, we want to have less harm in the world. I mean, Scientology presents itself as a harm reduction mechanism. It is not. It creates harm. It, well, we could talk about that endlessly. And there's there's a, philosophical underpinnings in the philosophy of Scientology that that sort of guarantee that outcome. And then you have a person who is accentuating and, and amplifying those flaws, you know, so kind of speeding the demise of Scientology. Right. So what, what one of the things that is going to make you incredibly unique to the Scientology watchers. Right. Um, is the only people that we've heard from who spent decades at international management. And remember, everyone, for those who may not know, the international management base in Gilman Hot Springs, California, is also home to the movie production studio called Golden right. Era Productions. Mark Headley worked at Golden Era Productions. Right. Um, a lot of the other executives we've heard from have done stints working at Golden Era Productions because when they would get busted off of their sky high posts, they would be assigned to be like the deputy paint removal in charge in Golden Era Productions. You know, some some lowly post where they yeah. send people to as a punishment, right? So yeah. Amy Scobie spent most of her career in international management, but I believe probably did some stints at Golden Era Productions. So we've we've heard a lot about gold. We've heard from a lot of people who spent time decades at Int, but never from someone who wasn't a Sea Org member. And that's there wasn't what, anybody else, Aaron. <laughs> well, that's like, what I'm saying. My, my journey when I got into Scientology at CC, we'll talk about that at some time. But I was a, you know, I had a drug problem. And, you know, Scientology was different back then. It was like part of the counterculture. It was perceived as part of the counterculture. And, you know, being of my generation and, you know, we were going to change the world, it, it sort of fit in uh, to that construct. But to get, when I was getting up drugs, they allowed me to live at the staff house for six weeks. And the they told house. me when you're, huh? What is the staff house? Staff house. The birth yeah, what, what, staff is, house. what is the staff house? Oh, I'm sorry. Celebrity Center, the original Celebrity Center when it was on 8th Street uh, near downtown L.A., um, they okay. had a... Okay, you meant the staff house in L.A. I thought you meant international management. Oh, no, no, no. The staff house, okay. the old CC staff house, was, uh, near the org you could walk. It was a few blocks. I lived there. I walked a course every day. Like, there is no other person outside the Sea Org that lived in the Sea Org. Like, I literally lived with them. And why did they uh, let you do that? Because they were genuinely kind people that wanted to help. They weren't after money. My father was paying $250 a week for me to stay there. And I was doing some very inexpensive courses. So it wasn't about money. There was no commitment. Uh, the person who I was interacting with um, basically said, if you do this and you apply yourself, you can get off of drugs. We'll help you do it, but you have to do it. And that appealed to me that somebody was saying, you have to do it. And she said, when you're done, then we can talk about if you want to do more Scientology. Until then, there's no pressure, no commitment. Who the fuck says that today in Scientology? You'd be, or you'd be commabbed if you were. Can you imagine a reg saying that? Well, you know, I, you know, you have a little problem with drugs, so why don't you? Go do Narcanon and then come back and we'll talk about If you want to come back and talk to us about Scientology, feel free. So there was no pressure, which was a very attractive uh, proposition, right? It was no, nothing like, you know, here's a contract. Or, but I lived with the Zurich for like six weeks. But anyway, we were talking about gold. But I just want you to know, uh, uh, yeah, so I was the only person that ever did that. I was the only person to, I mean, well, there was also my late friend, Danny Sherman, uh, who was also not in the sewer. And he and I had, you know, mine was not as visible, but our positions within the church were both pretty substantial. And neither of us were in the sewer. And we were both close to Miscavige. So, um, 
Right. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to hear from anybody else. Danny passed away. You're not going to hear from him. Yeah, uh, nobody, nobody knows who Danny is. Um, the LRH biographer. Sorry, I, I know, but they, but they've that. never, they've never seen. Yeah. It. Oh yeah, this is it. completely a yeah for you people out there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There was another guy who was a writer who also. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. I'm just, I'm a noob. I'm just learning. <laughs> that's okay. Um, okay. So that's, so uh, this was all because I said, what's going to make you particularly unique to all yeah, of the yeah, Scientology yeah. watching audience is that you spent, you know, 30, 28 30... years, please don't give me three decades. At least I can say <laughs> almost three decades, almost, almost three decades, almost three decades yeah. uh, working at international management uh, yeah, very a couple close. of those years, a couple of those years were at Scientology Media Productions because right. I helped to launch that, but that's a different thing. Right. Working very closely with David Miscavige. Yeah. And um living in this weird gray area where in some respects you're privy to things only a very tiny percentage of Scientology Sea Org members have ever been privy to. Right. And in that's other right. respects probably not seeing the darkest side of Miscavige, I'm guessing that you would have seen if you were a Sea Org member. Is that yeah, your sense I, of it? Yeah. Okay. I used to say that I lived in the twilight zone. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was fully aware that something was going on. I was in three bubbles. I was in Scientology bubble one. I was at gold bubble two, and I was a pro working at gold, which that was the third bubble. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty intense. Uh, it's, you know, yeah, I was definitely inside a reality distortion machine. Um, so, yeah, that I used to, it was really funny, Aaron. You just reminded me that people would say, oh, you're not in the Sea Org? And I would say, no, those guys, they're only in for a billion years. I'm in it forever. I didn't, I decided I wasn't going to shorten my contract down to a billion years. <laughs> I mean, who, the, that's just, you know, who the fuck does that? I'm here forever. <laughs> Just that was my thought stopping cliche to get them to shut up because you can't really counter that. You know, if you're going to talk to me about so if somebody, if I think they're going to go there, like, why don't you join this here? Well, because it's only a billion euros, man. Like, <laughs> if you're an infinitely, if those you're, are, gonna, if you're, those if you're are an rookie, immoral, those are, those are rookie numbers. Those are rookie numbers. Yeah, the rookie, myself. exactly. Rookie numbers, good choice of words. So, yeah, I wasn't into the, but that I used to say that, like, no, my, my contract's infinite. Theirs is only a billion years. Now shut up. So, so after all those years, though, why didn't they just have you join the Sea Org? Me? They? Uh, I don't know. They never asked. No. Are you serious? Uh, I was never oh. asked to join the Sea Org. Uh, I got chided in a nice way by Miscavige a couple of times early on. I bumped into him at the base, and he looked at me. He was, you know, this was back in the days when he was in uniform. He stopped wearing uniforms after a certain point which there's a whole thing about that that we could go into at some point when he migrated from sewer uniforms to, you know, expensive designer clothes. Uh, Cause I kind of saw that happen. Uh, but you know, it was summer and they were wearing whites, short sleeves, you know, the, the military thing, you know, the, you know, their costume, but they do this thing where they, they, whatever they're, they're like the Salvation Army. They dress up because, they're soldiers for Hubbard or whatever. But uh, so I bumped into him and he's like wearing in his whites with his entourage. And he says, hey, Mitch, where's your uniform? And at that time, I had a couple motorcycles, a couple Harleys in my garage. And I used to ride a lot on the weekends. And so I, I said to him, my Harley's in the garage. So meaning that's my uniform. Like, huh? So we could kind of, you know, the, the thing about people on that level, if they chide you like that, you need to be, you need to have a, a quip back. You need to have a snappy answer. You don't want to become in, like uh, interiorized by that kind of comment. Like, hey, Mitch, where's your uniform? Oh, you know, you don't want to choke. You just want to say, uh, uh, it's in the dry cleaners or whatever. You want to just say something. <laughs> so, wait, wait, that, there, there has to be a reason why you didn't end up in the Sea Org. Well, I don't think it was LSD because honestly, Aaron, I think if I had you know, kidnapped a bus full of orphans and addicted them to heroin and then burned down a mission, like maybe I would have gotten trouble because I was, I, eventually I got in a lot of trouble for stupid shit because that's just how the, the spiral goes, right? But for all, many years, it was like, plus I think he really needed somebody not in the Sea Org. Why? Uh, well, 
part of it, there's a bunch of benefits to that. For one thing, I was a professional and I already knew my job. Um, why? Because I guess, I don't know. I mean, ultimately, I don't know, but it just seemed to feel right that he needed somebody around him. He needed somebody in that position. I mean, so years later, he hired a, a wonderful man who was a few years older than me, who was the senior mixer at Gold. Uh, very talented, had been the head of the, the music department at Paramount Studios for what 20 years. Name? What was his name? Uh, Tim Boyle. He's a really terrific guy. He, he died, unfortunately, of liver cancer a couple years ago. Did but, he join the Sea Org? No. But I'm saying there was a few other people, most notably it would be me and Tim and, and mm -hmm. this writer who was the LRH biographer. Dan. Oh, and we can mention Dan yeah. Sherman. I just, just in general, people aren't going to know who he is. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I wanted to refer to him. by. Actually, I'm, when I was in the Sea Org, I was in the Sea Org with Jarrett, um, I want to say Rival. Uh, his mother was married to Dan Sherman. What was Dan Sherman? Did you know Dan Sherman have a wife? Uh, what was her name? I don't know. I just know it was Jarrett's mom. <laughs> oh, hey, unfortunately, I just got a text. Uh, there's somebody about to come over in 10 minutes. So I, okay. I thought I thought it was going to happen at 530. I'm so sorry. That's I right. Do you want to no, jump now or do you want to jump in 10 minutes? No, 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 uh, no. Just let's jump in 10 minutes. Okay. Well, what, no what was her name? Can you tell me what was her name? I just know she was Jared's mom. I don't know. So I was asking. What's did Jared's you... last name? I want to say Rival, but it's been a while. No, married to Danny. I mean, I won't know his mom's name. I got it. But I just know that in 2004, 2005, 2006, his mom married Dan Sherman or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Not that there. I know of. Oh, okay. I don't think that's correct information. Danny had a, a wonderful wife. He was super close with. She unfortunately died of an autoimmune disease and. And when? he, anyway, whatever, but, and then he had some close friends, uh, female friends, but I don't, he never remarried. So, oh. I mean, he was like the best man at my wedding. So, I mean, we worked together. I knew him really close. It's oh, like, wow. Yeah. I would have known if he got married. When did his wife die approximately? Oh, it was in the nineties. Oh, and he never got remarried. Okay. No, he, yeah. Um, you know. Okay. Maybe, okay. Maybe they weren't actually married. Maybe they were just a couple, but that's okay. Yeah. They could have been. He, Yeah. You're saying he never had a relationship with anyone after that? Oh, no. He had, um, I can't think of her name, but one a really lovely gal, OTA, who really helped him. Did she have lot. a son named Jared? Danny? <laughs> no. Does she? No, I, don't, think, I don't know. Whoever I don't, he was dating. <laughs> I don't know. I can I can actually, I'll find out for him. No, she it's okay. It's not important. She could have had a, a kid. She was a widower from, yeah, she could have. I don't know. But, uh, okay, so. So you're spending like 28 years working at international management. What's yeah. your commute like? Are you living in LA commuting oh, to? Say, yeah, it was horrible. Commuting um, to what? By the way, if you were to describe where international, where the gold base is, do you say Gilman Hot Springs? Do you say San Jacinto? Do you say Hemet? What do you say? Gilman Hot Springs. Because no. it's its own little town, right? No, gold is Gilman Hot Springs. No, but that's what I mean. Gilman oh, Hot Springs, yeah. California is its own little town, right? Yeah, yeah. It's population 300, whatever. Which well, is the international base, right? Yeah. The first the first uh, working title of my book was Fear and Loathing in Gilman Hot Springs. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, but I just uh, I decided to not call it that. Um, okay, so how did you commute from L.A. to Gilman Hot Springs? How, like, is it like two hours each way? What, like 90 minutes. Okay, that's not too bad. <laughs> no, I mean, some people for Los Angeles, that's that's like to the grocery store. Uh, yeah, it depends. I mean, it depends. When I was living in Glendale, it was less when I was living in the San Fernando Valley, it was yeah. more. But, you know, I, I got a, a decent car. I said, OK, I'm going to do this commute. And uh, so, you know, I went out and got a big, you know, German sedan. And, okay. You know, the, it was like whatever. I just I made it as comfortable as I could because I would drive out there on Monday and I would usually come back on Friday night. Sometimes I would have to stay longer. Uh Oh, but so you yeah, would stay at the base during the week. You didn't have to commute absolutely. every day. Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. I mean, I, sh I wish I wouldn't have, but because I hardly saw my kids and that's not good parenting. I mean, I can give great parental advice. I was not a good parent um, because I, mainly I wasn't around. And then also Scientology is the, does strange things to children. Essentially, kids need one thing I learned too late. They need to be seen and they need to know that they're loved just for being there unconditionally. Yeah. I love you just because you're here. That's what a kid needs. And in Scientology, there is a, a 
that mindset is like you need to do certain things to win my approval. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna need to jump off. I'll be available in 15 minutes if you want to continue. Um. Okay. Let's revisit that because I'm not sure. Well, you text me and let me know because I, I I I'm really sorry. I, I should have waited until after this, but that's all right. That's all right. So let me just tell everyone. Thanks for joining us for the 30 minutes that we've been doing this. Yeah. We might restart it shortly, but either Great. way, we'll talk to you soon. Great. All I appreciate right. it, Aaron. Yeah, bye exactly. Bye. Perfect. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye -bye. If you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, then you could click right inside here. If you have six or not, subscribe right here. Bye!